The Sociology of Education. We talk about the major theoretical perspectives in sociology a lot in this course, and we're circling back to them again now because each in their own way can help us to understand how education systems in the U.S. and elsewhere operate. For example, adherence to the functionalist perspective, see society as a complex system wherein social institutions work together to maintain stability. For a functionalist, social institutions will survive and be passed along if they are good for society and most of the people in it. If they are not, they will die out. Formal systems of education are a good example of this. Schools and colleges and universities perform a number of important functions that help society chug along smoothly. They perform obvious or open manifest functions, like teaching students important skills, reading, math, etc. And they also perform more subtle, hidden, or latent functions. One latent function that schools perform is child care. That gives kids somewhere safe to go during the day when their parents are at work. A lot of people didn't think much about this function until the COVID-19 pandemic hit the United States in 2020 and all of the schools closed down. Suddenly, working parents found themselves in a real bind, and even those who could also work from home struggled to do so while trying to supervise very young children and help older ones with online schooling. It was a real disaster for a lot of families and pushed a lot of parents, mostly women, out of the labor force. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, about 80% of the 1.1 million workers who left the labor force when schools went over to online instruction were women. Another key latent function performed by schools is socialization. Socialization in sociology is defined as the process by which people come to learn the values, norms, and expectations of their society. Distinct from the functionalist perspective, conflict perspective, or conflict theory, argues that social institutions are deliberately structured to maintain inequality and to advance the interests of powerful classes. Conflict perspective is all about how powerful groups structure social institutions, not to make society function better for everyone, as the functionalist perspective would argue, but to keep themselves on top. Unfortunately, we see evidence of this in the education system, too. For example, many early U.S. public school initiatives were less interested in investing children with knowledge than they were in stamping out minority language and cultural practices. In 1891, the U.S. government passed a law requiring that Native American children be separated, with force if necessary, from their parents and communities and sent to far-off boarding schools where they could be made to assimilate into Anglo-U.S. culture. Parents who refused to send their children could be sent to jail, and some were. Once enrolled in one of these so-called Indian schools, which numbered as many as 350 at the program's peak, children would be forced to dress in Anglo-European clothing and, in the case of boys, to cut their hair. They would also be given white names and would be punished, even beaten, for speaking their native languages. Richard H. Pratt was the founder of one of the earliest and best known of such schools, the Carlisle Indian School in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Pratt heralded the practice as a humane and kind one. In the 1890s, there were still some who were advocating that remaining Indian populations should simply be massacred. Pratt promoted the Indian boarding schools as an alternative, arguing, A great general has said that the only good Indian is a dead one. In a sense, I agree with the sentiment, but only in this, that all the Indian there is in the race should be dead. Kill the Indian in him and save the man. The photo depicts Navajo student Tom Torlino in a before and after shot that we used to advertise the school's program to potential backers in Washington. In the first photo, he wears native clothing and has long hair. In the second, he is shown Christianized or whitened, presumably a success story. His skin even looks lighter in the second once. Evidence of a different exposure on the film, like an early form of crude Photoshop. Similar programs of forced assimilation happened in Canada and Australia throughout the same time period. Conditions inside residential schools were often horrific, with surviving students reporting physical, emotional, and in some cases, sexual abuse. Mortality rates at the schools were also high. Some students died as a result of abuse or neglect, 
Others, crammed into poorly heated and unsanitary dormitories, died as a result of outbreaks of diseases like measles, typhus, or tuberculosis. A few are known to have died of exposure, trying to escape and walk home. In 2021, discoveries of more than 1,000 unmarked graves at the sites of former Indian schools in Canada made international headlines. Families who had had children taken away were often not even informed when they died, and the practice of burying children in unmarked graves and leaving scanned records means that the number of dead may never be known. The photo on the left shows Native students, pre- and post-assimilation. The photo on the right shows a memorial of children's shoes placed on the former site of the Kamloops Indian Residential School in British Columbia, Canada, after the remains of 215 children, some as young as three, were found buried in unmarked graves in summer of 2021. Assimilation, this time of immigrants, not native populations, was also one of the primary driving forces behind the implementation of mandatory public schooling in the United States. The peak period of immigration into the United States was between 1860 and 1920. Native-born Americans, then as now, worried about the U.S. becoming, quote, overwhelmed with foreigners, and were scared that these newcomers would fail to assimilate, learn English, and become good patriotic American citizens. Assimilation, by the way, describes the process by which an immigrant or minority group gives up its own identity by taking on the characteristics of the dominant culture. Many public school curricula look for ways to Americanize immigrant children. Teachers and school administrators attempted to retrain children of immigrants toward so-called American values and practices and away from those of their home culture. One of the primary conflicts at that time was between Protestant native-born Americans and newly arrived Catholic immigrants from Ireland and Southern Europe. It isn't as common today to see religious tensions between Protestant and Catholic Christians, but in the early 1900s, anti-Catholic prejudice was very common. Many Americans believed that the Pope himself was behind the big waves of immigration to the U.S. and that he had plans to overthrow the U.S. government and instill himself as king. Teachers and textbooks of the era taught overtly anti-Catholic curricula, and one popular textbook went so far as to refer to the Pope as the Antichrist. School curricula often teach both their intended subject and a hidden curriculum. The hidden curriculum refers to messages about norms, values, and beliefs that are, intentionally or not, included in lessons about other subjects. Patriotism and the message that America was supposed to be a Protestant country was part of the hidden curriculum in a lot of turn-of-the-century American public schools. There are other examples, some of which are still with us today. Take the Pledge of Allegiance, which is still recited in most U.S. schools. The pledge was written in 1892 by a Baptist minister by the name of Francis Bellamy. Bellamy had his own ideas about the kinds of values that should be taught in schools, and his original pledge went as follows. I pledge allegiance to my flag and the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The pledge has changed since it was written. By 1924, the National Flag Conference, under the leadership of the American Legion and the Daughters of the American Revolution, changed the pledge's words to changed the pledge's words "my flag" to "the flag of the United States of America," because part of the purpose of the pledge was to teach children of immigrants loyalty specifically to the United States, and it was feared that "my flag" was too unspecific. Also, you may have noticed that the words "under God" were not included in the original wording even though Bellamy was a Baptist minister. For him, the key words were indivisible, which recalled the Civil War and the triumph of the Federal Union over states' rights. The message that Bellamy still wanted to send to a divided United States was that we were all one country, despite the lingering memory of the U.S. Civil War. The words under God were not added to the Pledge of Allegiance until 1954 with the support of President Dwight Eisenhower. 
1955, again with Eisenhower's support, Congress added the words, In God We Trust, to all paper money, and in 1956 it made the same four words the nation's official motto, replacing the Latin E Pluribus Unum, or Out of Many, One. During the same period, legislatures introduced constitutional amendments to state that Americans obeyed, quote, the authority and law of Jesus Christ, although those did not pass. Why did this happen in the 1950s? Well, by that time, Americans had begun to move beyond their prejudices toward Catholic immigrants and had focused their fears on a new enemy group instead. This period, often called the Cold War, was characterized by extreme tensions between the United States and countries allied with it and the Soviet Union and countries allied with them. Because the Soviet Union and many other communist countries were officially atheist, many American politicians began to argue that believing in God was central to being a good American. Some also felt that teaching American children to believe in God would protect them against growing up to be communists or Marxists. Thus, new religious messages crept into schools' hidden curriculums, but for political reasons again, rather than spiritual ones. Being a good American no longer meant you had to be Protestant, but for many, it did mean that you had to reject atheism. Education as an agent of stratification. Formal education is the primary route to social advancement in the United States. However, access to it has been, and still sometimes is, stratified by race, class, and other factors. Following the end of the Civil War, former slave states scrambled to prevent newly freed slaves from gaining political power for a very simple reason. In many rural southern counties, African Americans were more than half the total population. In some cases, they were as high as 80 to 90 percent of the population. If freed blacks were allowed to educate themselves, vote, buy land, or move into positions of power, whites would quickly become the minority group. Former slave owners were also frightened that their freed captives would want revenge. So Confederate states began quickly passing so-called black codes, and later what came to be called Jim Crow laws, laws that maintained segregation between blacks and whites and tightly controlled what blacks were allowed to do. One very effective way of keeping blacks powerless was to prevent them from getting an education. Thus, black children were crowded into underfunded and overcrowded college schools and barred from attending state colleges and universities. In Plessy v. Ferguson, 1896, the Supreme Court of the U.S., sometimes abbreviated as SCOTUS, held that segregation was legal so long as white and colored facilities were equal in quality, although they almost always, always weren't. By the way, segregation in the American South didn't exclusively impact African Americans. The Supreme Court case that specifically legalized segregation in public schooling concerned the case of a Chinese American family who sued the state of Mississippi to allow their daughter, Martha Lum, to attend white schools. They lost, and the case, Lum v. Rice in 1927, held that states had the right to exclude Asian students and minority children more broadly from the better-funded white schools. It wasn't until almost a hundred years after the start of the U.S. Civil War that segregation was ruled unconstitutional by the Supreme Court in Brown v. Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas. However, many states and school districts resisted, and it would take years and the help of armed U.S. National Guardsmen and a small number of brave African American students, including this one, a six-year-old girl named Ruby Bridges, to integrate American classrooms. Even after Brown v. Board of Ed and the civil rights victories of the last century, American schools remain heavily segregated racially in large part because neighborhoods themselves are segregated. And public schools in poor neighborhoods are certainly not equal to public schools in wealthy ones. Much of that is driven by the way we fund education. Public schools receive the majority of their funding through local property taxes, meaning districts with high-value homes can raise more than districts where housing is cheaper. If that seems confusing, think of it this way. People with big fancy homes pay more property taxes than those with small, run-down homes do. That might be fair, but the money raised in the district stays there, 
Rich neighborhoods mean rich schools, and poor neighborhoods mean poor schools. In Texas, 65% of school revenue comes from local property taxes, and so Texas schools range from a spend of $5,140 per student in some districts to over $20,000 per student annually in others. And there are other ways that education can act as an agent of stratification, preserving or hardening inequality across generations rather than dismantling it. The correspondence principle refers to ways that teachers or schools subtly promote the values of each social class and perpetuate class divisions across generations. For example, lower income students are often tracked into slower classes where values like obedience and the completion of rote tasks are emphasized. They spend all day filling out worksheets, for example, whereas the upper-class kids, who are assumed to be college-bound, are down the hall learning how to do Model UN or build their own computers. We saw this with gender for decades. Boys took academic subjects to prepare them for college and careers as lawyers, doctors, or politicians, whereas girls took typing and home ec, and that was about it. Many school districts still engage in the practice of tracking, grouping students into different courses of study by test scores, grades, or perceived ability. Tracking is controversial. Skimming off the top achieving students and putting them into more advanced classes can help them excel. However, students placed in slower tracks start to fall behind, especially in math and science classes. And they often end up in classes with less enthusiastic and motivated teachers, or in classrooms where the school may be focusing fewer resources. The interactionist perspective is all about how we build identities through social interactions, that we become who we are in part through the statuses and roles and labels that our society puts on us or those we choose for ourselves. So tracking children into fast and slow classes is also controversial because it facilitates this process of labeling. Labeling theory argues that the process of labeling someone creates a self-fulfilling prophecy that shapes their future behavior. In the case of a child, it can be pretty easy to see how slapping a label like slow on her can encourage adults to treat her as if she is less intelligent, and, over time, for her to come to believe it. Another example of the interactionist perspective in the classroom is the teacher expectancy effect. This term comes from a famous study first done by Robert Rosenthal and Principal Lenore Jacobson in 1968. The pair told teachers in Jacobson's school that a new IQ test indicated that certain grade 1 through 6 students were about to experience a period of intellectual blooming. IQ tests can't really predict that. Students who the fake IQ test indicated were about to become gifted were actually selected randomly. But the study found that at the end of the school year, those kids really were doing better. Their IQ scores really did increase, by between 16 and 27 points in some cases. This was most noticeable among the lower grades, not so much among older kids, which makes sense. However, this has been replicated over and over again with different methodologies. We can imagine how this plays out at the interactional or micro level if we think about it. Teachers are more likely to criticize students they have a lower opinion of and less likely to praise them. Conversely, they tend to call on students they believe are more gifted more often, give them longer to answer questions, give them more hints and more second chances to get things right. This extra attention and encouragement leads to those students becoming more self-confident, getting less discouraged, and working harder. There have been many attempts to make public schools in the United States more equal. By the way, public schools are those that anyone can attend for free, as compared to private schools, which can charge tuition and turn students away. It's long been noticed that schools in high poverty areas tend to have students who show worse academic performance and are more likely to drop out. One attempt to rectify this at the federal level was a law originally passed under George W. Bush called the No Child Left Behind Act which required that schools administer standardized tests to students, like the TACs or STAR exams in Texas, and report the data to parents and the federal government. 
Schools that had too many low-performing students from year to year could lose their federal funding, have their leadership fired, or even be closed. No Child Left Behind was replaced under Obama by a new law, the Every Student Succeeds Act, or ESSA, that still requires standardized testing but allows states more leeway to set their own accountability standards. The problem with this approach, though, is still standardized tests. Also, punishing impoverished schools by taking more money away from them doesn't always help. Laws like No Child Left Behind, or ESSA, are one reason you probably spent a lot of time practicing for and taking standardized tests if you attended a public school in the United States. The average American student takes 112 standardized tests between pre-kindergarten and 12th grade. These are all ways that education can either work to dismantle inequality or reinforce it, and here's another one. Education is the primary means of social advancement in a credentialist society like the United States. Credentialism refers to an increase in the lowest level of education needed to enter a field. You're probably familiar with this concept already. Many jobs that your parents or grandparents only needed a high school diploma for now require at least a bachelor's degree. However, post-secondary or post-high school education is expensive here, as you also probably know. That means, to enter higher earning jobs, students must suffer high tuition bills and years of lost earnings. The average annual tuition cost for a four-year public college in Texas is now close to $11,000. Since 1980, the cost of attending public colleges nationwide has grown by about 344% a fact that leaves lower-income, working-class, and even middle-class students hobbled by debt after graduation. The average amount of student loan debt for the graduating class of 2019 was close to $30,000, and that debt accrues interest. For borrowers who can't repay their debt quickly, or th who go through periods where they can't pay at all, interest and fees add up, and the total amount owed can end up doubling or tripling. We see stratification in higher ed by class, gender, and race, just like we see it in primary or secondary education. This chart uses Bureau of Labor Statistics data from May 2020 and looks at the percentage of 16 to 24-year-olds who are enrolled in college. Asian Americans enroll at the highest rates, at close to 90%. We talked earlier in the semester about why this might be. For starters, Asian migration to the United States is still largely made up of professional migrants allowed into the United States only because they can do specialty jobs. If most members of a new migrant group have BAs, master's degrees, or PhDs when they arrive in the United States, we also expect to see their U.S.-born kids and grandkids going on to earn advanced degrees at higher rates, too. Whites enroll at about 67% of the population, Hispanics at 63%, blacks at close to 51 percent. Minority students do tend to take longer to finish college than white students do. This is probably partially due to a need to work longer hours to afford the tuition. Women are now more likely to enroll in college than men, at close to 70 percent for women in that age group compared to only 62 percent for men, and they are also more likely to graduate. It is now the case in the United States that women are more likely to hold college degrees than men are. These are some figures on the current cost of higher, or what we call either post-secondary or post-high school education. On the left side of the slide, you see the average yearly cost of tuition and fees at private colleges in the United States, public colleges in the United States, public colleges for out-of-state students, and finally, at the bottom, community colleges. Education doesn't need to be as expensive as it is. Other countries do certain things to keep the costs down. First of all, campuses aren't as fancy. There are fewer amenities, no expensive sports programs, etc. Second, they are better funded through taxes, but taxes are definitely higher, something we've discussed in other lectures in this course. Controversies in education, privatization. In the United States, there's a really predictable ideological split between Republicans and Democrats over how to fix stuff. Democrats and liberals tend to be a little bit more supportive of so-called big government, 
meaning they tend to push for higher taxes, usually on top earners or businesses, and advocate that the money be redistributed downward through social programs, i.e. toward more money for schools, colleges, universal health care, rent support, etc. Republicans, in contrast, are more likely to say no. We want less government and lower taxes for high earners because they'll spend their money themselves or donate it and it will so-called trickle down. Their solution is often privatization. Allow for-profit companies or corporations to provide services like healthcare, education, run prisons, etc. Strip away as many regulations as possible so they can do it however they want and pay them the tax money so that they'll do it better and cheaper than government-run organizations instead. That's the theory anyway, and in some places it might work. That can work great for consumer goods, like cars, for example. For the provision of services like education, it can be a little bit more complicated. For example, some areas give parents the option of leaving public education behind altogether by instituting voucher programs, which give tax money back to parents to allow them to use it to send their kids to private schools. Voucher programs have, may help cover the cost of private school for some families, but they have been criticized for a couple of reasons. One, the amount of money given via voucher isn't usually enough to allow poorer families to cover private school tuition, though it may act as a discount. And two, advocates of strengthening public schools point out that draining them of even more resources won't help. Also, private schools don't have to take all students who want to enroll the same way public schools do. Students who cost more to educate, like those with physical or learning disabilities, ESL students, and others, may be left behind in even more cash-strapped public schools. Another move to turn education over to the for-profit sector has come in the proliferation of for-profit colleges, which are run by private companies or corporations to provide post-secondary or college education as a profit-generating business. Tuition at such schools is often higher, even than at state universities, and costs more than, a, more than about five times what you would pay for a community college. Graduates also often face obstacles getting hired. In 2021, the U.S. Department of Education announced it would forgive student loans for some borrowers who had attended for-profit schools that defrauded students of tuition money before closing due to bankruptcy. Another very current controversy, at least at the time of this recording, are laws being passed in some states, including Texas, to control how topics like racial and ethnic stratification, and also gender inequality, are taught in classrooms. Some target an intellectual movement called CRT, or critical race theory, which originated in scholarly writings in the 70s and 80s. In academic writing, critical race theory mostly referred to attempts to bring discussions about race and racial discrimination into scholarship in fields ranging from history to the social sciences, and to engage in ways that racial discrimination was institutionalized into American laws and social institutions. For example, a school lesson about the Constitution would talk about the revolutionary freedoms it guaranteed, like the right to speech or assembly, but would also give equal time to discussing ways that it enabled slavery to persist in the new American nation, for example, through the Three-Fifths Compromise. Some modern-day opponents, however, have argued that these kinds of lessons are a form of indoctrination. In 2020, former President Donald Trump banned federal employees from training that discusses critical race theory or terms like white privilege, calling it propaganda. This tweet from the conservative Texas Public Policy Foundation lists terms such as white privilege, structural discrimination, or Black Lives Matter that might signal a teacher is teaching from a problematic CRT perspective. In July of 2021, the Texas State Senate passed SB3, a bill that would restrict how topics like these, are taught in K-12 schools. Among other things, the bill stipulates that teachers must not be forced to teach about controversial current events if they don't want to, must explore the topics from diverse perspectives without giving deference to any one perspective, and may not include concepts like the idea that any individual, by virtue of their race or sex, is inherently discriminatory or oppressive, or that they bear responsibility for actions committed in the past. The bill also forbids teachers from inculcating in students the idea that an individual should feel discomfort or guilt 
on account of their race or sex. Finally, the bill insists that teachers teach topics like slavery and racism as deviations from or portrayals of the authentic founding principles of the United States. On its face, none of that sounds particularly controversial. Of course, teachers shouldn't teach that any one race is better than the other, or that a child bears guilt for something people who looked a little bit like her might have done in the past. And slavery or discrimination are betrayals of American ideals like equality and freedom. Critics argue, though, that it might create a chilling effect on classroom speech. For example, if teaching about racism makes some white students feel guilty or uncomfortable, does that mean the teacher has done something wrong? Does mandating the discussion that discrimination be taught as a deviation of American ideals forbid discussions about what we call structural or institutional discrimination? Structural and institutional discrimination refer to discrimination that occurs as a result of the normal operations of a society or institution. Discussions of structural discrimination often explore ways that inequality is or has been structured into the United States' legal, educational, and economic systems. I should add that insofar as this course spends a lot of time talking about these subjects, it might be affected should future iterations of the law ever attempt to constrain how these subjects are taught at the college level. That concludes this lecture. Thank you for listening.